Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. I don't overcome by trying harder, by promising to do better. All I do is set myself up for a fall and disappointment. But when I say, Lord, strengthen me, you shed your blood for me, give me what I need to rightly live for you, he does it. And when I cling to his word, when the enemy lies and I'm like, yeah, but the word says, it is written. Happy Friday! In today's broadcast, we have a new two-part study from Pastor Sam entitled, Paul and Felix. Acts 24 takes us from Paul being found guilty in the eyes of the council and the chief priest, to yet another trial, this time in the presence of the governor Felix, and he is there for quite a while. So let's listen in. If they made a movie out of Paul's life, and well, they probably have, haven't they? But, but I mean a real movie, you know, like high budget and all that. They'd probably have a scene at this point where that little thing comes up that says one week earlier. And you'd have a little bit of a flashback. One week ago, Paul is in the city of Caesarea with a dear friend, Philip, and his daughters who prophesied. And then this guy, Agabus, comes down and he binds Paul's hands with his belt and says, this is what's going to happen to you when you get to Jerusalem. And everybody starts saying, oh, Paul, don't go, don't go. And, and I think, man, there have been so many times where I thought I understood what was going on. And I said, oh, Lord, don't let that happen or please. And Here's the amazing thing. Paul goes down to Jerusalem and just as was prophesied and predicted, he's arrested. A week later, they bring him back to Caesarea where he will spend two years and he'll be free there. I mean, he, he's, he's a prisoner and, and all that means in this context is he's staying in one of Herod's beautiful palaces that he built and he's being provided for by the Roman government. He's being protected from the Jews who are trying to kill him by the Roman government. And we'll see at the end of the chapter, he can have anyone he wants to come, and he does. He preaches, he teaches, he writes. Who would have thought a week earlier, when, when the, the word was, oh, bad things are going to happen to you in Jerusalem, oh, Lord, don't let it happen. Who would have thought this was the only possible way you're going to get Paul for two years in your city? Now, he's traveling, he's a church planter, he's a pioneer. And so we see that those things that we're so concerned about and we pray, oh, Lord, don't let them happen. I look back on them and I could give you example after example after example. And I say, wow, Lord, you were right in the middle of that, not just aware, but working and, and planning. And I see how all things are working together for good. All of that to say is we believe the scripture, but when we're actually going through a trial, we forget. And we need to walk by faith in the midst of the trial. It's so easy to look back and say, thank you for getting me through that. And what we want to say is, Lord, thank you for being with me right now, even in the midst of it. Well, five days after they bring him to Caesarea, Ananias, the high priest, came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullius. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullius began his accusation saying, Seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is brought to the nation by your foresight. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. Tertullius, he is a hired gun. He is a lawyer. And, well, he begins his accusation with an obvious attempt to flatter the judge. Now, he is in fact an expert in two things, flattery and rewriting history. He rewrites the history of Felix, whom he is standing before. And I got to tell you, I imagine every eyebrow in that room began to rise as they listened to this crock. Because the reality is, historians tell us that this guy, Felix, a man of boundless cruelty, who thought he could commit any crime with impunity, whose corruption and violent oppression were legendary. He was the worst of the worst of the worst. So we have this lawyer, and I'm you know, not going to tell any lawyer jokes. Joe Vandervoort's here. If you want some, talk to him in the lobby after. He's got a million of them. And lawyers can tell lawyer jokes. I don't want to tell lawyer jokes. I might need a lawyer someday. And so in any case, he's saying, oh, our peace, our prosperity, it's all because of you. You're so awesome. You're so wonderful. And I'm thinking no one in that room can believe what they're hearing, except maybe Felix, because... 
you know, the heart's desperately wicked and deceitful. He might have thought, I really am a pretty good guy. In reality, he couldn't have been a worse person. Well, this guy, as I shared, not only flatters the judge entirely improper, but he also rewrites the judge's history. And now he rewrites Paul's history. It's recent. But he says, we found this man, verse 5, a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. You know what a plague is? It is a disease that is deadly and brings death to many. Interesting that they would call Paul a plague. He was anything but. He brought a message of hope and life and transformation and forgiveness. He preached that God loved the whole world and that there was salvation in Christ Jesus for any and all who believe. No, Paul wasn't the plague at all. They call him a creator of dissension. The word means strife or division or destruction. Ironically, of course, this is true of Felix and it's true of those who were standing before Felix accusing Paul, but it was not true of Paul. Now, you know, they say even a stopped clock's right once in a while, and the ringleader, this guy, he actually, um, he gets one right. He calls Paul, excuse me, a ringleader. He calls him a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. The word ringleader means a captain or a chief or a champion. It is a true compliment. He means it as an accusation, but Paul had to just be smiling at this one. Because even this guy, who's, he's a plague, he's a descender, he's, he's a ringleader, a real troublemaker. Listen, if someone were to call you a captain among God's people, what are they saying? That you're a leader among men, and you're leading people to Jesus and for Jesus. A chief, it's used in its best sense. Long before the word became politically incorrect, it just means someone who is the head. Now, Paul would never claim to be the head of anything good. The only time he calls himself chief, and he does, he said he was the chief of what? Sinners. That's right. The chief of sinners. He said he wasn't worthy to be called an apostle because he persecuted the church of Jesus. Nevertheless, God forgave him as he has us. And then he did some amazing things. He doesn't just forgive and adopt and say, okay, well, you know, you can come, but you got you to gotta sit back there. I don't want to have to see you. No, he transforms and uses us, puts us right out front. He was a champion like David before Goliath, like Gideon in his day, like so many others. Paul belongs in the heroes of faith. The only reason his name's not there is he wrote that part of scripture, I believe. In any case, Paul, no plague, no dissenter, and he certainly was a leader. Well, they go on. He even tried to profane the temple. To profane would mean to violate or to desecrate. How could such a thing be? Well, they had seen him around town with a Gentile and they assumed that he must have brought him into the temple. Now listen, I mentioned this last time when we actually looked at that passage, but I just have to bring it up again. It's so easy to assume the worst of people we don't like. That's why it's important that we love people we don't like. I'm not going to tell you, you got to like everyone because the Bible doesn't say that. But it does say we need to love everyone. And I need the love that God gives me for people to over whelm me and, and override my natural tendencies to, well, I, I like people that I get along with. I'm not that argumentative and I'm not, I don't really like to argue. And, and by the way, if you want to argue, I'm not going to say talk to Bud, I usually say that, but, but I'm not going to say it and here's why. Because the Bible says the servant of the Lord must not argue. So if you want to argue, go talk to God. Argue with him. Because we're not supposed to argue. We're supposed to be examples. And, and one way we're an example is not to get caught up in that nonsense. And so he was guilty in their minds by association. It would be like you downtown Thursday night. You just go to get some uh, you know, kiwis or whatever they got down there. And, and you see a friend and he's actually in a bar and he's like, come on in. And you're like, mm, and you're come on out. And he does. And you stand out front with them. And someone goes by and they see the two of you together and they remember you used to party together. So they're like, oh, did you see so-and-so? He's partying again. Yeah, I saw him right in front of the bar with so-and-so. You know people do that. And when I say people, I mean us. And, and so we want to make sure that if it does describe us, we stop. That we don't work for the enemy. We'll see it again. The accuser 
of the brethren. In fact, he says it here, profane the temple. We seized them. We wanted to judge him according to our law, but the commander Lysias came by with great violence, took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. He didn't profane the temple. He's going to defend himself in a minute, but he won't flatter and he won't accuse. No, what he does is he just tells the truth. And we need to know that the accuser of the brethren, Satan, is a real student of human nature. And he also watches God and he sees that God likes to and chooses to work through people. Is God limited to working through us? Of course not. You know, in the story of Balaam and Balak, that God spoke to Balaam through a donkey. And I've heard, well, some say he spoke it through a lot of donkey sense. Although the old King James uses another word altogether, which makes it even funnier. But in our context, I'll just stay where we're at. And the point is this, that, that the accuser wants to accuse through you and through me. And I know you have this experience because I have it. I'll have a thought. It just comes into my mind. It's something negative about someone. Usually they're not there. Have you noticed this? You can think a lot of weird about people. You get face to face with them and you all of a sudden you, you have compassion on them. They may be struggling. They may be suffering. They may be sinning. But, but, but all of a sudden you're like, well, this is a person that I care about. But it's easy for the enemy to talk to us and plant seeds that would lead us to accusation. And it's also possible for us to just dream that stuff up. Now, I gotta be honest in this area, and I don't know why pastors say I gotta be honest. Of course we've gotta be honest. But, but anyway, the, the, the thing is, I can't always tell if I'm just thinking it or if the enemy's planting it, but I do know this, it's not the Lord. He doesn't want me to work for the enemy. He doesn't want me to be an accuser of the brethren. That's why I don't assume the worst about you. But I also need to be wise. And, and I realize in a crowd this big, there are some of us who are caught up in things mentally that can lead to things physically, that can lead to devastation in our family or socially or at work or in our health. And so we want to be wise, but I never want to assume the worst. And you don't want to assume the worst either. Love thinks the best. It's not gullible, but it does think the best. Well, Satan has always been accusing we're going to study Job after we finish Nehemiah and uh, Esther. And, and Job, it's an interesting book. Satan appears before God and begins to accuse Job of only serving the Lord because the Lord is good. And when I read that book, I think if that accusation were made about me, I mean, would there be any foundation for it? I mean, do I really just love God because my life is good and easy? And by the way, it's really good, but not that easy. And, and just like yours, all kinds of complications, all sorts of things happen that, that I'm like, man, Lord, if I didn't know you, if I didn't know you were good, if I didn't know your promises, I'd be devastated by this. So we all go through it. And when we're suffering, the enemy comes and accuses us. You deserve this, you know. I mean, it's one thing to be a non-Christian and to be in sin. It's another thing to be a Christian and in sin. And so often we do actually bring things on ourselves. And then the enemy comes and accuses us. And here's what I've learned about the enemy. He always brings me to two things, the law and the mirror. He brings me to the law so I can be reminded that I'm a guilty sinner, a lawbreaker. And then he brings me to the mirror so the focus will be on me. The Holy Spirit takes me straight to the cross. Oh, he knows I'm a sinner and he knows I need forgiveness. But he understands if I come to the cross, then I'll confess and I'll find cleansing and forgiveness and restoration. So if you're feeling condemned ever in this building, you can be sure that's not my intention. That's not God's work. Conviction, yes. Condemnation, no. Why? Jesus didn't come to condemn. And neither can we. Neither should we. Well, in any case, they were working for the enemy. They see God working through people, and Satan does, and he works through people as well. Well, Jesus had the same kind of problem. They say, oh, he was profaning the temple. With Jesus, they said, first century terrorist Jesus, you know. He said he was going to destroy the temple and in three days raise it up. The Jews objected. They said, 46 years we've been building this thing, and you're going to raise it up in three days? Jesus never said he was going to destroy the temple. He said, you destroy this temple, speaking of the temple of his own body. And in three days, I will raise it up. 
It was a prophecy of his crucifixion and resurrection. And his disciples didn't even get that. Not at first, but after he was raised from the dead, they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Well, Satan accuses day and night. In fact, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven. And, and then we find Satan at the throne of God. And some are confused by this. Jesus saw Satan's fall from grace. He, he served God. He worshiped God. He was created by and for God. But he rebelled and fell. And Jesus is just saying, I was there. Why? Well, Jesus is creator. He's God. He saw it. But Satan still had access to the throne of God at that point. We know that because he appears with the others in Job. That's long after the fall. He still has access to the throne of God today. And you know what he's doing up there? As Jesus is interceding, Satan is accusing. Satan's accusing, as we're told, day and night. And even God, though his patience seems to be unlimited, it actually will come to an end. And he'll be like, not one more word. You are gone. You're done. And he cast Satan down to earth during the time of tribulation and great tribulation. Now, I think we're going to be watching this from front row seats, but up in the balcony, from up above, you see. And Satan, well, he will no longer be accusing. He will be ravaging the world. He will be destroying in every possible way in that day. And how will they overcome him? Hey, the same way we overcome him, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and that they did not love their lives unto death. By the, the blood of the lamb. I don't overcome by trying harder, by promising to do better. All I do is set myself up for a fall and disappointment. But when I say, Lord, strengthen me, you shed your blood for me. Give me what I need to rightly live for you. He does it. And when I cling to his word, when the enemy lies and I'm like, yeah, but the word says it is written. And that we did not love our lives as they won't love their lives to the death. It's just saying, hey, if it comes to death, then we go to be with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Well, Paul now has his opportunity. After the governor, verse 10, had nodded to him to speak, he answered saying, Inasmuch as I know you have for many years been a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. He, of course, recognizes Felix. Felix had been over the area where Paul lived and ministered for a decade. And so he, he says, I know you know these things. So let me tell you how it really is. Because you may ascertain, verse 11, it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone or inciting the crowd, either in the synagogue or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. Paul says here, look, I did go up to Jerusalem, but I went up to worship. And by the way, that was primary of all the things he could do to be in Jerusalem during any of the feasts, but especially the major feasts, to, to be in the city called by God's name, to be in the temple built for God's glory. That was Paul's heart. And the only thing that took him out was the commission to go and to preach and make disciples and, and to reach the world for Jesus. So he came primarily to worship and secondarily to bring an offering to the suffering, impoverished church at Jerusalem. This I confess to you, he says, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things that are written in the law of and in the prophets. They called the early Christians the people of the way. I love that because, of course, Jesus is the way. He's not a way. He's not a savior. He is the way. He is the savior. He is the resurrection and the life. And, and I like it because Paul's saying, and he knows that some of those who were accusing him did not really believe all the scriptures. He says, I believe all things that are written in the law and in the prophets. So let me ask you a question. Is that true for you today? Because we are living in a generation where multitudes of people who call themselves Christians and only God knows say, well, I believe in God and I believe in heaven, but I don't believe in hell. Paul certainly did. Jesus certainly did. Paul will, will say in a moment, hey, there's going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. The just are going to heaven. The unjust got to go somewhere. And that place turns out to be hell. But, but the issue before that is that Paul said, I believe all of the scripture. So when the Bible is clear on issues, 
How can anyone who really believes the Bible say, well, I just think that was Paul's opinion. Paul was either right when he said all scripture is given by inspiration of God or he was wrong. And if he was wrong and we get to sit in judgment on God's word, well then, are we now the authority? Are you going to trust man instead of God? Man, don't ever do it. The, the reality is, I trust the word. Now, I trust people who are trusting the word. Now, I, I, I trust God to work through people and, and so much goes on. We're working together. But in the end, it's God we're relying on. And he says, I believe all things. And by the way, when he says, he says uh, they call the way a sect, the word is heresy in the Greek. I know they think this is heresy, but I believe all things written in the law and in the prophets. Jesus, of course, the fulfillment of those all things. I have hope, he says, in God and in a world where people put their hope in so many, well, that can't deliver, God can and will which they themselves also accept there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Now listen, there are some, and I get this on a human level, that, that say, okay, I understand heaven and I'm looking forward to being there, but I can't really understand how a loving God could send people to hell. First of all, he doesn't send us to hell. People actually choose. No one here will end up in hell that doesn't make a choice to reject God's offer of forgiveness and pardon. That's a fact. God says, I so love the world, I sent my only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever will come, he says, drink of the waters of life freely. God chooses first, but then we get to choose. The analogy most appropriate is the marriage relationship. We talked about the upcoming couples retreat. And by the way, it's married couples just in case. Married couples retreat. But, but the, the deal is, is, is God uses marriage as a picture of our relationship to him because you understand when a man sees a woman and he's like, man, she's the one. And if he's a Christian, he prays, oh, help her think I'm the one, Lord. And, and, and I say, hey, just be the best man you can be. Be the guy she needs and it might work out that way. Don't focus on her, focus on you becoming the man that she needs. And the deal is, is if a guy went and proposed to, to her and, and it's like, you know, she's like, well, I'm not sure. And he, you know, lifts up his thing. He's got his 45 there, you know, and it's like, you will marry me. And, and uh, well, you know, it, it, it's a, a new take on a shotgun wedding, right? Here's the problem with that is that you could get someone to marry you like that. But I'd suggest every day have the dog test every meal because you just don't know. You see, you can't captivate and take someone prisoner because you love them and want to be with them. Nor will God do that to us. He doesn't force the issue. Does he want us to be with him? Yes. Could you prove it any more than sending your son to suffer and die for sinners like us? No, God has demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But he will not force us to heaven. And if anyone ends up in hell, it's because you say, I don't want to be with God. I don't want to be like God. I don't want to serve God. I don't want to represent God. I don't want God. While I understand that God does not send anyone to hell, that still does not make the idea of hell any less difficult for me to process. In terms of such a difficult truth, I have reached a point in my walk with the Lord where many others have either turned aside or tried to change the Bible to meet their needs by saying, I can't believe a loving God would allow such a thing as hell, thus eroding their very confidence in the Word of God. Well, I just have to say that I might not understand it completely, but I do understand that God is merciful, just, and He is perfect. So I rest in faith that sometime in my life, probably on the other side of the grave, when I stand in His presence, I will understand. And it'll be like, okay, I get it now. In the meantime, I must look at the cross. Jesus going to the cross is not an act of an unjust God. The cross tells me that God has given everything to keep me from hell, short of forcing me to place my faith in him. He does leave that to me. And while these types of things can sometimes cause me to scratch my head and wonder, I have to think about Isaiah 55, 8, where we are told, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts.
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.